Hello and welcome to today's video. So this time it's a bit of a long one, I'm afraid, but I'm going to be showing you the process that I go through once or twice a year when I have like a shelving or shunting session. So um, what you're looking at right now is um, my the start of my vintage pan paperback collection. So you can see the books that are sort of not the ones I'm looking at now, but the ones just below. Those are books which are like recent acquisitions or ones that I've had to pull out of my collection to film dedicated videos. So fairly recently I've done a dedicated video on George S. Simenon. I did one on uh, Graham Greene, uh, John Steinbeck, uh, those sorts of authors. So because they've I've had to go into the collection from the various publishers, so Pan, Penguin, all the other independent ones. I've had to pull those books out of the collection. I'm now putting them back into the collection and making sure that they're in the proper numerical order and basically re rebuilding my display. Um, so I have perhaps, I think, my best estimate is about twelve to 15,000 books in my collection, of which, you know, 13 or 14,000 of those are paperbacks. So because of that, storage is a massive, massive problem. Um, I love my old books, and I really do, but until my eldest son has left school, um, and he's just about to go into six forms, it's not going to be for at least a couple of years, and uh, has left home and you know is making his way in the world, at that point, I can then have his bedroom... <laughs> <laughs> turn it into my dream library. So until that happens, for the time being, the majority of my paperback collection, but not all of it, but the majority of it is kept sort of upstairs in like a, not a converted attic, but like a boarded out loft area, attic area, where I've been able to, um, you know, make the most of the space, shall we say. And I've got um, a, a mixture of like these half size bookcases, which is the one I'm using now. And right next to it, the white one there is more like a standard IKEA bookcase one. They're not expensive, they're about 20 pounds from IKEA. And uh, they're very, very good to hold a lot of paperbacks. They're not made for paperbacks, but as you can see, and we'll have a look at those in a moment, um, you can get quite a bit on them. So, what I'm doing now. Each of these sort of slightly longer, or wider rather, bookcases, the pine-coloured ones, they can each hold a stack of four vintage paperbacks side by side at the back. And then, so I do that, literally four stacks, boom, boom, boom. And these are all in series and publication order, so they're all numerical, which is why I'm doing this. And then I put a row of books in front of the four stacks there, um, and basically that's it, they're, they're rebuilt. So um, that's that's basically how I shelve my paperbacks. Now, unlike the pan books, I don't get that many new ones every year now. I probably get, well, it, you know, it does depend you know, on my luck. Um, but my pan collection, I don't seem to be getting so many as I do vintage penguins. And that's probably because there are dedicated vintage penguin book dealers out there and there aren't really any dedicated pan dealers um, so this is the bottom shelf of the first one here so initially then this video will go through and see me get all my pan bookcases looking good get the books back into order and um, as good as they possibly can be then I've got an awful lot I've got about two box loads of vintage penguins, predominantly post-1000. In fact, they're all post-1000 books, pretty much, um, that need to go into my main penguin series run. So we'll have a look at those in a while as well. But to make space for the penguins, I'm going to have to move some of the lesser penguin series out, where I've got room on a pelican shelf. So it all sounds rather complicated, but have no fear. Uh, we'll go through the process. You'll see how I do it. And it's sort of um, making space in one area to uh, to make room in another so I can continue the run, basically. So once again, you can see this has got the four stacks. And some of the Pan books I have got additional copies of. Um, sometimes it's because Pan themselves made a change to the cover art. Um, and I do, I have started picking up different pan covers now because they uh, 
you know, they've got different artists and uh, they're part of the collection, really. And some of them, have, you know, the, the variances in the covers is actually really nice to have a look at. So uh, I think they're worth, uh, worth doing for that reason alone. But certainly this is a job that I don't, you know, I enjoy doing it because it's lovely to go through my vintage paperback collection and have a look at some books I've not seen for a while. But at the same time, it's quite a lot of work. And um, this video actually took um, a couple of afternoons to film because there was so much. It's, you know, a fairly confined space in the loft, as you can imagine. So I could only get one spotlight up there. And um, I changed the camera angle as much as I possibly can to keep it interesting. But it's, uh, it's a tough old... Uh, it's a tough old film to be honest but the finished result looked fantastic and you saw what it was like at the start there and you'll see you know all the penguins that i've got to file away and the finished result is, is great i'm really really pleased with it um it's something i've been meaning to do for ages and um, although it's not like a comprehensive look at all the books in my collection we do see some of the other like publishers and collections that i've got around it as well that I've, i keep up in the loft um, as i said it's not my very best or my most valuable by any means but it's my uh the books that i have to keep in the loft simply because at the moment i've got nowhere else for them um the dedicated library is certainly going to be looking good um you know when it when it gets built and i've got some some big plans for that but whilst it flashes up on the screen i do want to thank my uh patreon and channel members so uh i do occasionally have clear outs in my doubles of paperbacks and i've got another one due fairly soon i did a video a couple of months ago and i was really surprised by how much interest i got from it and lots of people ordered some books which is fantastic um, i've got new books that i've added to it some off the back of this video i found more doubles that i already had which was brilliant and um my patron and channel members will always get access to those sort of sales videos before a whole, at least a week before everyone else so they get like the first bite of the apple as it were um and i am planning to do another one of those probably in about two weeks time and i would have added at least another 50 or so books on top of what i sold last time so you get an idea of exactly uh what was uh what's still available from the collection because there was an awful lot to go through but yeah back to the uh the proposed dedicated library so basically once my son's left home and that may not be for a few years yet you know two three years maybe a bit longer who can tell um there's no hurry but when he does that will basically free up a room and um, I'm going to get purpose-built paperback bookshelf in floor to ceiling and one either side of sort of the uh, the main windows coming in as much as I can squeeze in basically then above the picture rail um, that will be just a large um, I won't put any extra shelving in but that will be the tops of the shelves and that will be an area that I'll use going all the way around um, for large format or heavier books and collections so for you know in my penguin collection I've got like standees and things like that that's where those sorts of things are going to go on my uh, my, pa uh, my penguin books shop display sign that sort of thing and I think that'll look really really cool so I definitely make the most of the space that I've got so that's around all the four walls. There won't be any furniture in there with the exception of a chair and a little table. Um, so I'm going to have a nice comfy reading chair where I can go into the, the, basically what's going to become a library. And then I'll either have two rows of back-to-back, -back, these like white Ikea bookcases. I'm going to have two rows of those back-to-back -back either side of me. Like, So I'll have um, three in a row and then three back to back against them so that'll be six bookcases there and another six to the right of me and my chair will basically be in the middle and those ikea bookcases the white ones which we'll see in a little while those are going to be used for uh, my hardback collection basically so that's a little bit more spread out and sporadic but the idea is i can pretty much get most of my book collection then into just the one room it will take the way out of the loft and in the loft then i'll have plenty of room to uh get my uh, sort of toy collection out now we are looking at something that's going to be happening over the next sort of you know five years or so but it would be nice to get all the uh, toys out and the toys and the toy collections is going to be the the first thing i sort of start 
thinning down on um, as I get a little bit older and head towards retirement. Whereas the books I'm going to keep because I hope to read as much into my retirement as absolutely possible. Um, as long as I can still see and hold a book, then there's no reason why I can't be enjoying my library, basically. And I certainly, you know, hopefully intend to be uh, YouTubing. So uh, I shall, uh, we'll see how the, uh, the sort of channel goes over the next few years. But that's sort of the long term plan. And I think, you know, I think it's going to be quite quite a good plan, to be honest. Um, obviously, I don't know how the, the channel's going to be going. I've been doing YouTube for three years now, and um, in fact, over three years. And I'm, you know, really pleased with how it's shaping up. It's going with great guns, and I'm starting to get recognition and stuff sent to me from, from publishers and that now, which is brilliant. And I always love to review new stuff when I, uh, when I get the opportunity. And uh, what I'm doing here, these are old beer towels. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with those, but back in the day, you'd get these traditional, like, um, beer towels for the for the different breweries, and they make really good, like, dust covers. So to stop my books getting dusty, and as you know, on my other channel, the Unintentional ASMR channel, I do have dedicated cleaning videos. And just last week, I actually finished the numbered pan books, which is the ones that we see here. Um, and I'm about to start on the uh, on the great pans next, so that's going to be quite a quite a journey. But the pan books are such great fun; they got brilliant, beautiful covers, and um, I just just love them. You know, I mean, Penguin is always my first love, but the pans. Well, I, I'd say I love them both equally nowadays. You know, um, I keep finding so much stuff in pan that, whereas with the penguins, because I collected them so long, I'm not really finding much new and what I'm left to find or buy in my collection is so expensive it, it, it doesn't really thrill me whereas I can find a pan that I've not got for a quid and uh, be over the moon with it and uh, it's all about you know value for money and I think that's probably why I got into collecting paperbacks in such a big way because it was like a poor man's first edition in, in a funny sort of way now these are two of the Ikea bookcases immediately next to the smaller pine bookcase that we just saw now unfortunately because the camera is literally right behind me you will see me uh, knock the old tripod a couple of times but I'm going to use the same principle so the books that are all sort of out of place you can see they're sort of on the top there sideways on those need to come out I need to pull out the main run of collection and slip the new ones back in it's as simple as that now you can see on my bookcases there I've got like the little little pan advertising things and on the top right there that's my James Bond bookcase and we'll have a look at that one in a moment so all my James Bond books including my pan ones have all been pulled out of my main pan run and they're now kept separately in a uh, in a bond a bond shelf I have got books immediately on top of this as well I mean, you will see them later on but thankfully nothing that that was out of position it was all in place on those ones so that's good news but as you can see these ikea bookcases are great they can hold an awful lot of books but they're they're not you know they're not purpose built for uh for paperbacks in fact they're even a bit big for for normal like first edition hardbacks they're okay for annuals and that but they don't take a lot of weight so you can you can see there that the uh the bookcase shells are ever so slightly bowed not a lot but a little bit because paperbacks don't weigh an absolute ton but i'm certain that those bookcases aren't really designed for the amount of books that i'm shoving on them but <laughs> as i said you know when you're a collector such as me and you do collect a lot of books or have collected lots of books over over the years um you're a bit stuck really aren't you you have to make do with what what you can do when I first moved into this house, um, one of the first things I did was get a dedicated bookcase from my Penguin collection, but I very, very soon outgrew that. But it was beautiful to have the bookcases the, the perfect height, so I did them. I had them made so that they would fit anything up to a B format book, which is the ones which are ever so slightly bigger than an A format, the ones that we're looking at now. And, um, you know, they were, they were brilliant, but because of where they were, um, if you weren't careful, they would catch the sun. And um, 
also had a young you know my son was born and we got a dog so there was too many things at risk to, to damage the books and I didn't really want to do that so in the end I, I took those down sold the bookcases which went you know, really quickly because they were purpose built and um, I moved it all up here now this is a slightly closer look at the Bond collection and that's the uh, the James Bond books there and you can see the little just above where it says Thunderball that's Casino Royale it's the first and second printings and on the Bond books I'm not trying to get every printing but I am trying to get all the different covers and different prices and I'm well on the way with the uh, with the earlier books now there's not many I'm missing to be honest but a few but a few but that copy of Doctor No was a nice early one that I picked up recently at Hay on Y with my friend uh, Steve the outlaw bookseller it was only about 250 so I was really delighted with that one it's the first movie tie-in of that it was two and six and the one that I had was a later one which was priced at three and six so I was pleased to find that one but there it is I've just sort of slipped it into the collection there now these bookcases you see they wobble a little bit but they are screwed together the two white bookcases and there's a lot of weight holding them down so I've, although they wobble a little bit there's no risk of them actually falling over or anything like that they're actually I've got wedges in underneath them and it tilts them ever so slightly back so that they keep them dead level um, it's only because um, the way that the loft is it's only been boarded out um, as I said it's not a, a proper conversion per se so the floors are a little bit uneven which is a shame but you know as I said it's serving a very very good purpose and it means that I've got access by having the books like this I've got access to everything when I want it and as we'll see later on behind the bookcases is where I can put boxes of lighter stuff like toys and games and and things like that and traditional stuff that you would stick in a loft like you know family heirlooms and you know stuff for the kids and things like that so here's the very next shelf down and quite a few to file away in this particular area but you can see at the back there that there was some room that had been made so once again this is coming back to the time when I've pulled books out for various videos where I've done like a set video on Simonon or Steinbeck or Graham Greene someone like that you know So as I said, this was a, a two-day video. It took me to actually film it. Um, it was very, very hot uh, the first day I was in there. In fact, it was fairly hot the second day. But um, it was a job that I felt, at the end of it, when you see what it looks like, it's so much, so much better. I mean, it really is an absolute joy. And because they're now all in perfect position, um, obviously all my paperback collections I have very well organized so everything is catalogued so not exactly what I've got at any one time um, but it just it also means because they're all in order if I'm doing a video on a particular author for example I could literally go to the shelf and I'm going to know exactly where it is and there's a lot to be said for that and not just that by doing them in numerical stroke publication order you can see the evolution of the publisher as you work your way through the shelves and that's really really evident with the early penguins through to the wartime ones then the the, the ones from the, the late 40s into the 50s the design changes into the 60s um absolutely fantastic when you when you do that and you've got a lot of them you can really see it um with pan not not so much but you do see quite a difference between the earlier ones and the uh, 50s and 60s ones Now I have sort of lowered the sound right down on these. Now you're not missing anything, but because it took most of the afternoon, there's you know there's a bit of background noise. Um, sometimes I'm sat on a stool, uh, which is incredibly uh, incredibly noisy. So I've just sort of made the sound quite low, and um, you know you'll just hear sort of my narration, and um, I will add on a little bit of like background music when I come to the editing stage of this very very light just sort of classical for the bits when I'm not speaking but you can enjoy the process and hopefully this will give you some ideas about how to shelve your paperbacks or at least make the most of them uh, make the most of the space that you've got it is difficult because long term you're not really supposed to have books stored like this they should all be you know stood up rather than laid down but I've got no I've got no other option it is as simple as that
So this is how I'm having to do it out of necessity rather than choice. But certainly, if anybody else has got an idea about how you could, um, you know, make the most of the space, I'd like to know about it because I've, you know, been collecting books for a long, long time, sold them for, you know, most of my adult life, brand new, and um, although this would never be, this would never hold up in retail, I couldn't hold them on this, for actual storage, I think this is th the way to go. Now, while we're on the pan books, literally in a couple of weeks' time, I'm about to uh, visit perhaps the largest, well, it is the largest privately owned pan collection of vintage pan books uh, outside of pan themselves, and that's uh, uh, Tim. He runs uh, Tim runs the the pan collectors website Ticket.net, and um, Ticket.net is an absolutely phenomenal website, and it's got every pre nineteen seventy pan listed. It's got an awful lot outside of that as well, and um, Tim himself has built. A proper archive because uh, he's only missing one odd pan book out of everything that he needs um out of everything that they published rather and it does exist we just don't know you know why he hasn't come across it yet i haven't got one either so it is obviously rare and it's just like a weird obscure crossword book a junior crossword book of all things but um i'm going to be visiting tim and um over the course of a couple of days, um, we're going to try and film really interesting bits of his collection. But he stores his books because he's got so many. He stores his books um, like in like a proper archive where you pull pull a section of wall out and it will be books floor to ceiling. And he's basically got an area of his basement, I think, um, done out like that. So anyway, look out for those videos in a few weeks' time because I think they're going to be fascinating. Now you can see the shelf below the one that I'm working on at the moment. It's got loads of loads of extras, and those are books that are post ISBN pan books, which um, are predominantly SF titles or ones which have got a number on, um, but they don't fit into the main numbered series. They've got a letter on rather, like an A, a C, an M, an X, that sort of thing. So they're part of those series but they're not numbered, so I've put them right at the very end. It's sort of A to Z. And the bottom shelf there is sort of my overflow. The other thing you're not going to find, so remember I said that the James Bond books are separate, and we've seen those. My Pan Books of Horror Stories is a separate collection as well, and we will spot those a little bit later on. And that's because that's a series that I'm currently working quite hard on to finish um, in first edition. There's 30 of those in total. I'm trying to get really nice copies, but once again, I'm trying to get all the different covers that were published for that series, and that's going to take a little bit more time. But once it's done, I'm going to do a really, really comprehensive video on the Pan Book Horror Stories, and I'm hoping to get one particular guest on as well, which is, uh, um, we'll see if that, that can come off. When I visit Tim's place, as I said, the Pan Collector's website, Tim owns no less than, I think it's three or possibly four of the original Pan Book Horror Stories original covers. How amazing is that? So um, I shall be making sure when we visit Tim that we look at his Pan artwork collection because it's uh, pretty fantastic. I've got just one Pan cover in my collection and I think Tim must have, well, I don't know, possibly 50. I don't know, but we're going to have a look and see uh, see what he's got um, for us to, to, you know, to ogle over. So I managed to get that shelf in just about. These are some of the big thick E's and M books. a few more recent editions that have gone and it, it really is a case of you're on your hands and knees doing this and um, as you can see it's only like a, a wooden floor you know not even any carpet in. I got some mats the other side some rugs out which is just makes it a little bit more comfortable um, and predominantly when uh, the boy and I were used to come up into the loft when he was small and we do a bit of classic sort of Xbox gaming we had a spare TV a little TV up here and we used to do some gaming up here which was great fun but uh, 
these on the bottom shelf here. It's a bit knee breaking, but it has to be done. <laughs> and they do look great, these plans. They really, really are fantastic. I love them. And here I'm literally just checking which numbers are to fit and get them all in. I've realised I've got two copies of Captain Blood by Raphael Sabatini. And it just means that, you know, one, another one's come my way. So I'll keep the best one. And put the other one into my, uh, my swaps box. So that's the one I'm... That's the one I'm keeping, which I think was the one I had to begin with anyway. It's quite a, quite a collectible series out of the Captain Bloods. Don't know why. I think it's sort of swashbuckling sort of action. But the palm books I first started collecting, it was the James Bond ones, and I was only a teenager at the time. And I remember picking up off another book dealer I picked up the first printing of Casino Royale um, and that was cost me like £12 I think which was quite a bit at the time but I was I was delighted to uh, to get it um, I think I was just showing up to the camera there two copies of the same book like different editions um, yeah I was really pleased to get it and that was sort of the start of me collecting Pam um, and it was mainly the James Bond ones um, but there was um, a chap who I knew called Gordon and he used to come into my shop and he was picking up the pan James Bond books and he had he was collecting every single printing um, even if it was the same cover he was just literally going for every single printing and he had an entire bookcase probably similar to the one that we're looking at now just full of the James Bonds and it was an incredible sight to behold but they were stolen, um, so he didn't sell them or anything, they were stolen. He, he doesn't even live in the UK anymore, he, he emigrated to, I think, Canada. Um, but yeah, I don't know what happened to that. It was an incredible, incredible collection of James Bond. You've never seen anything like it, and um, yeah, they, they were nicked, and I don't know where they ended up, but I, I certainly didn't see sight of, sight, of, sight of them again, so yeah, quite interested in that. Now, we're over to the last bit now, the last couple of shelves of my Pam books now. And I didn't really even go in the loft looking to do the, the Pam books, but um, I thought, well, I'm going to do this properly. I'm going to do all the different, the various series that I've got out um, so that I'm bang up to date and everything is really nicely sorted. And it's also good to do this because it does create a little bit more room and you can sort of, you know, see the wood for the trees, really. Um, I've got um, just a little batch of um, books due, which I bought from the States and it's... Uh, Don Pendleton's The Executioner series. So I don't know if you've ever heard of those, but they're uh, Mac Bolan is the series, and basically they uh, they're like what they call a men's adventure paperback. And I've got Pendleton himself wrote the first thirty-eight, and I've got twenty-two of the first thirty-eight. I think there was one he didn't write, but I've got twenty-two of the original run on their way from the states that i got pretty reasonably priced and I, th I believe they are all first printing so i'm very much looking forward to reading those and i'm going to do a dedicated sort of video on them as well so i'm going to have a little spot for those um executioner books the mac Bolan books there's it's an incredible run to collect i think there's best part of 400 in the series but i'm only going to stick to the uh, the late 60s um, 70s ones um, which were written predominantly by the sh the series creator I'm not going to bother with any other later ones unless someone says well you've got to read you know this one or that one and maybe I'll get the best of the rest as it were but we'll see I think there is a, a lot on eBay as we film this and it's 1 to 450 um, for 250 pounds um, but it is literally six boxes of books and um it's bar collects and he's nowhere near me so uh i'm gonna have to give those a miss um as much as i'd be tempted and not just that where on earth would i put another 450 books at the moment i'd be i'd be struggling let's say i'd be struggling 
but we're almost at the end of the pan books now but that bottom shelf was in a bit of a disarray so i was uh, um it took a little bit of time to get those sorted out But this principle of having a few shells with them books behind, it seems to work well. I just think it maximises the space more than anything. But it has been, um, it's been a, over a year, I reckon, since I've had a really, really good shelving session. And the last one I didn't film, but I did do one um, a couple of years back and it actually did pretty good, you know. Um, people seem to be quite curious to see how I shelve all my books and I think this time round you'll get a really really good sort of behind the scenes look at how I handle my sort of collection of books at least the ones that I've got in the loft here there's loads downstairs so I've got all my uh, my very rarest penguin books like the the wartime forces book clubs and services editions and things like that my king penguins they're all on a dedicated bookcase downstairs I've got my the bulk of my Star Trek books a separate um, my Doctor Who book collection is separate as well. So there are other series which uh, aren't up here um, because I just, well, I've got room in, in the office to have them out on display down there, which is cool. And uh, I just like them where they are, actually, to be honest. So uh, brilliant. So we're moving on to the uh, the bottom shelf now. So all those books that you see lying in front of the bookcases, those are all ones which are like, very tail end pan books the white spined ones are called pan pipers and that was pans like miscellaneous non fit on the whole non-fiction series and then the ones with the black spines are like later pan science fiction titles and then the ones which are a bit more colorful on the whole once again are pan science fiction sort of late 70s to mid 80s uh, by various authors Philip K. Dick, Harlan Ellison, a few of what they call the pan lozenge with a particular logo on the front. So uh, I wanted to get those uh, stacked away and I'm just going to put them on A to Z basically. But those very, very thick pan books there, these are the uh, the E series like classics of literature and uh, the H series as well. And the different lettered prefixes is just dependent on how much pan we're selling the actual books for so the higher the prefix basically the thicker the book the more expensive it was to buy so those ones there that black one there the four and rise of the third reich and then uh, russia and then a book on kennedy those are all h series books they did three and that's the three and they're uh, they are quite expensive when they were published that is so slightly off camera here, but I am sorting out the uh, the pan pipers and trying to get everything into order. But it's they're tough because the pan pipers are all over the place. You almost have to look at the actual front cover to make sure they're in the correct order. You can't just do it by the number on the spine. There we are. I'm starting to rebuild them now. a little bit of dust on that bottom shelf as well that had been picked up. But I try and be careful. I, I take the hoover up into the loft, even though it's not really visited a lot. I try and give it a hoover once every month, every couple of months, I suppose, just to um, go along the shelves and you know make sure there's no cobwebs forming, that sort of stuff, you know. It's not a bad thing, but the main thing is it's bone dry, and that is really, really important. I have got a dehumidifier, and it's currently in my studio because that's in the garden. And although, you know, I'm, as I said, I film this in the summer months, so it's not particularly um, wet or damp out there. It could be uh, during the winter, so um, I have the dehumidifier running then. And it's amazing how much uh, moisture it pulls out of the uh, of the little uh, little studio shed there. There we are, so I'm starting to rebuild this final bookcase now, final shelf. But 
I said these pan pipers are a bit fiddly and um, I did start putting them back and I realized I've made a mistake <laughs> it's like oh no what have I done now uh, thankfully I didn't get too far into it before I realized the the mistake but then I had to pull them all back off again and, and rebuild it it's like oh <laughs> And that was when I realized I probably needed a, a, a short break because <laughs> I've been at it for, uh, uh, already at this point. Although, you know, we're only half an hour into the, the video. What you're seeing here has taken me the best part of, you know, a couple of hours probably to get it all, all done. But this was pretty much the last bit of the pan book. So that was like step one as we uh, put these back in the correct order now. <laughs> I've never actually, I don't think of, oh yeah, I did do a video on the Pan Pipers actually, uh, but I managed to miss a couple out of the time. That Victoria is a nice one, it comes in a little slip case. As I said, they're sort of non-friction. Right, so then I'm on to some of the uh, ones which are, I've got letters on, but they're not actually uh, part of the main series. So I fill the rest of the bookcase up with those. So them all looking good and then the rest of it I literally have nowhere else for them at the moment although when I finish the entire thing I have actually got a shelf where these potentially could go with my sort of slight pan overflow so we're gonna see but for the time being um, these predominantly SF titles can go right at the end of the run here and I think they'll be absolutely fine all I'm doing there is just popping them into um, author surname because they're uh, they don't have a series number of any sort but there we are that was the uh, that was the pan run done it was like hooray it's like phew. and there we are so this is a little run through of how the pan collection looks right now so that's with the numbered series a couple of little promo bits and bookmarks and stuff like that so on the whole, they're pretty much looking looking all right. As I said, they did go up onto the, right up to the ceiling there, <laughs> and a couple of odd display bits. There's the uh, dumping headers there, the uh, standees rather, which are really nice. Into the James Bonds, and James Bond related. And actually, I didn't film these, I should have, but on the side of that bookcase is a load of other James Bond point of sale, which is really nice as well. I should have shown that since we're having a really good look at the uh, the pan collection. But there we are. So that's the, uh, that's the pan books. Now, this is over by the pelicans. So my pelicans are just sort of as is, and I'm still picking them up, but there's a whole empty bookcase, a uh, bookshelf there. Um, there's the, the second batch of pelicans. So these are the earlier ones so I've got two bookcases and that's behind it is science news and uh, like the biology one so basically what I wanted to do was um, fill up the empty um, shelf now near that is some of my other publica uh, publishers so this is the Hutchinson's up above it there and then that's my uh, Belmont and Belmont Tower the Glance sci-fi SF Masterworks um, and my Philip K. Dick and also Philip Jose Farmer books. Uh, at the bottom here is my sort of miscellaneous American publishers which have all been cleaned and recently filmed for my other channel. Then I've got my Century of Hardback series, it's dubbed there double wrapped or double shelved rather. That's my Churchill, Second World War, First World War, a couple of volumes of his biography. These are my door books distinctive yellow spines just about squeeze them all onto the one shelf a few odd later Star Trek and DS signs and that's a couple of very early uh, Winston Churchill books in first edition they're very very early ones 
So that's that sort of little corner next to my uh, next to my pelicans. This is another shelf. So I've got some sort of art and game related stuff at the bottom. My shelf of young James Bond by Charlie Hickson books. This is like very early British publishers and then Digit behind. Uh, more early British publishers and more Digit behinds. And those are my uh, American 50s and early 60s nightstand sort of sleaze books. Very, very scarce. Collins crime novels there. Collins Crime Club. Some cool stuff there. My Albatross collection, which uh, is really overflowing. That definitely needs another shelf. That's my Badger books, those yellow spined ones there. And my Fontana collection. And for some reason, I didn't show the one below that, which is my hard case crime. That's my movie and uh, TV tie-ins. And below that is um, my miscellaneous British paperbacks, which I've got to film. Um, that's uh, the tail end of my four squares from Doctor Who, Pan Horror, as I mentioned. More four square books, which became the New English Library. This is my vintage Hodder, Saint Books, Ed McBain, and The Three Investigators. Oh, and my photo novels. <laughs> so a bit of a mishmash shelf, that one. Now, this is the start of my Penguin collection. So it's like some, uh, this is the Penguin Collector Society stuff. That's my vintage Corgi paperbacks. My John Norman Gore books, American and British. Uh, Simpsons related books and on the bottom Star Wars related books and some Dickens hardbacks and that's predominantly Kingsley Amos that's my westerns Edge books uh, comic book related paperbacks uh, my Casca books and a couple of others this is no books about penguin books and this is uh, books about books and also fan club and uh, you know fanzines and private press stuff, that's Penguin 60s. There's my big Penguin book sign from the 1960s, that one's a lighted one. Now this is sort of the mess that I've got to go through, so I've got empty shelves, all of that stuff is, is new acquisitions by the very last shelf on the right there, the last pile on the shelf. That on the floor needs Ruth packing away, that's that pile there. I've got another whole box of new acquisitions of Penguin there. The, uh, the shelves in the front as well, it's uh, it's a lot basically so what I thought I'd do um, where what I'm looking at now is stuff which isn't part of my main penguin collection so I'm pulling off different series uh, these are additions that I've had for more minor series like that those black ones were penguin poets for example and um, that's an odd 50s catalog I don't know how that one ended up in there um some odd uh, penguin handbooks and reference books which I I really like the handbooks actually up there starting to grow on me and odd reference books and things like that and um basically the the sort of the smaller sort of more minor series that I don't that I haven't got you know dozens and dozens of books I want to pull those out and move them over to that shelf which was empty next to the pelicans because I've got a whole empty shelf there basically and hopefully that will then create quite a bit of room for all those extra penguins that you just saw because basically it's a couple of comic boxes of new acquisitions and about three or four piles all needing to go back into the main numbered series of penguin and that's an awful lot of books um, now with penguin I try and collect pre-1969 stroke 1970 which is when ISBNs were introduced in the UK so um, prior to that Penguin used their own numbering system and that's the uh, basically that the main series that literally started at number one and they went up to about 3200 3300 there or thereabouts so I'd like to get all the numbered ones eventually that I could but like a lot of collectors I've st I've tried to concentrate on the first thousand that was be like my main that was my main thing and anything else I picked up after a thousand um, I would try and pick it up if it was nice condition but I wouldn't be going sort of out of my way to pick them up but if I was out and about looking in charity shops or at boot sales, I'd obviously pick them up if I saw them cheap, that sort of thing. And there were some of my all-time favourite authors that published after Penguin 1000, so I'd always pick those up. So back in about 1990, I reckon, is when I probably started to collect penguins, you know, 
really seriously. And um, I just, you know, I just went out on my normal travels and I'd pick up everything that I could come across, basically. And there was, um, I'm in Plymouth, and there was a dealer in Exeter at the time on Exeter Quay. And he had a little shop which was stuffed with them. And that was actually where I got my penguin sign from, my penguin shop sign. It was in the very early 90s, I reckon about 91, 92. It was only 20, 25 pound, I think he let me have it for, which I was very pleased to pay that for. I also picked up um, quite a rare penguin at the time of him, um, The General Goes Too Far, number 383, that was also 20 pound. And I picked up a Forces Book Club, the very first one I got. Uh, called the Chinese and that was a fiver so there you go, gives you an idea of the pricing the rest of his books were between a pound or two and uh, that's uh, that's where I sort of started getting collecting into penguins and um, I remember come 1995 that was their 60th anniversary and by then I had my shop and we were selling some books from penguin uh, that were new and included in the 60s in actual fact and we did a nice window display sort of celebrating Penguin's history and um, that was uh, that was sort of the really the start I joined the, the Collectors Society at that point as well and um, started getting dedicated Penguin dealers catalogues and this is you know a lot of this is way before anything could be found online on the internet eBay hadn't really started not for a couple more years so very much the dealers were still quite old-fashioned they'd um, type up um, a, uh, a catalog and send it out in the mail and it was almost like first come first serve that's that's what it was like back in the day and I've still got all those catalogs and I do intend making a video on the very earliest days of sort of collecting paperbacks because if it was a good catalog I always kept it and I've ended up with a real box load and I think they're fantastic so anyway, back to the video here. These are the series that I've now moved over, and these are going to go into the pe the Pelican bookcase down there uh, when I get round to collect uh, to sorting those out. But that's not something that I had time to do for this video. Um, I have got about a dozen or so pe Pelicans to go in, but I'm going to just rejig those out. Um, I have for my main channel. Um, I've already filmed the first 200 Pelicans, and I'm going to be filming Pelicans 201. To 300 fairly soon within the next couple of weeks so I'm going to use that opportunity when I dig those out to put all those other series that you've just seen back into situ so uh, once again just making the most of the space but on the pelicans I do need um, to have everything for the first 600 which is within my sort of remit of pre sort of 6970 I do still need perhaps about 30 so I'm well on the way there. Um, there are not that many to go now. Uh, but I've not gone out of my way to try and finish the last few until the last couple of years, really. I've sort of tried to start filling in a few gaps. Anyway, I'm now at the stage where I'm starting to put the, the series that I am going to keep in this situation. You know, in this in this bookcase, I have started to rebuild these now. And it's exactly the same as the, uh, the Pan books. I... Uh, I've got room to put four smallish piles stacked and then a run of books in front. These are my uh, Penguin Classics. I'd like to get more of the original classics, but once again, I'm quite fussy in that I only like them in really like top-grade condition. And um, I don't tend to come across them that often, to be honest, out and about. But when you do find them, they're generally cheap. What I do like is the is the penguin handbooks, so I'm gonna try and get some more of those if I get a chance. I'm pulling some of the books on top now. So that's my run of penguin reference and they're visible with those sort of red and black spines, generally speaking. And a couple of odd West African ones on the end, which actually look a bit like pelicans. <laughs> But it's just about making the most of the space you've got. And uh, that's all I'm trying to do here. These are some of my Q series, the Penguin sort of miscellaneous books. That's a series I would like to finish off at some point, the Qs. But they're difficult to find, um, some of them anyway. But they, uh, it's a good little series to, to pick up on. 
My favourite is Q21, The Penguin Story, which has got the full catalogue up to 1956. Um, and I just love that book. It's brilliant. So now I'm, uh, I've am i moved over my Puffin Picture books, which is on the shelf that I'm working on now. So that's those sort of long, larger oblong books which poke out a little bit. And also there includes my like Penguin Modern Painters um, and anything uh, Penguin published, which was that sort of size. And now I'm moving over my American Penguin paperbacks and books published by the Infantry Journal, which was like a little spin-off from those, uh, from those Penguin wartime releases which i absolutely love but don't tend to find many over here these days and when you do the price is being asked is just ridiculous so i'm not really uh, i'm not really picked many up lately but i like them i definitely like them there we are and then the shelf below that is actually um, like a slight um, pan overflow shelf. It's got some stuff on the pan book of horror stories and uh, it just fits nicely there and some pan promotional stuff as well. So now I'm moving over to the next shelf along. You see there's basically there's two shelves empty, but I need to have a once again a shunting session basically. So on that middle shelf all on its own. A special 148 S148 and that was the last vintage special that I actually needed to get and um, I've got a few which are on my upgrade list but that was the last one it's almost like a pamphlet very very scarce scarce little book that one and I'm basically just moving the uh, moving them down to create a bit more room and of course making sure everything's in order as well Now the problem we find with some of these bookcases, because I've had some of them for like 20, getting on 30 years, and they've always been in use. Sometimes the backs, which you like tack on, if you're pushing against them, they do tend to start to fall to bits. So uh, what I tend to do when I've, uh, I didn't do it this time, but when they are out, um, I tend to go back and tack them back in. This particular bookcase isn't too bad, but a couple of the ones I've got are not great. And I need to retack the the little bit of board that goes on the back of them. But I absolutely love the Penguin specials. They were supremely topical at the time. They came out at the start of war, uh, the Second World War, and um, they had massive print runs. And Penguin sold an awful lot of them, sometimes 200,000 copies of a particular book. Um, pe people didn't have TV and uh, cinema was a luxury. They had the radio, of course, but people just read more. And um, the Penguin specials were very, very popular. And because they did so well, when war actually broke out and paper rationing came in, um, what publishers were given was based on how big their pre-war sales were. And because Penguin sold so many of their books pre-war, Penguin's paper allowance was actually fantastic compared to a lot of other publishers. So they had a real advantage during um, during the wartime years to uh, to publish really whatever they wanted, which was amazing. When you think what came out, what started during the war, stuff like the King Penguin hardbacks, the, the Puffin list was started. I mean, poetry, lo loads of different series started um, because they had so much money, which was just so much paper rather, which was incredible. Uh, it just shows how successful they really, really were back then. So once again, this was a shelf that I was on my hands and knees. <laughs> it's a hard life being a paperback collector. They look all right. Actually got a little bit of spare room, which is cool. Now I'm moving over the uh, sort of tail end puffin 
storybooks. I really like these. I've got the first hundred complete now. And I'm uh, working on the second hundred. But number-wise, they're going to go up to about 330 before um, the... Uh, before the series is done so i'm having another little rejig here so they're the very earliest specials and these are the puffins all laid out because i got quite a few new puffins as well probably about a dozen for my collection so the b formats are at the end and the rest of them i've sort of laid them all out along the top of the bookcase and then got them in order so they're ready just to be packed away and that's what i'm doing right now but yeah i do like the, the puffin storybooks and um it is a surprisingly difficult series to pull together because a they're they're aimed at children so trying to find them in nice condition is tough some of them are aimed at very young children sort of like um you know the under sixes as it were and those ones are amongst the very hardest to find i think they're usually quite fragile and uh, when copies turn up they're often hammered and there's a few like that in the first hundred but the more adult ones, or the le you know the less exciting subjects, those are uh, quite easy to find. The most expensive one is, um, uh, I think it's number one six one, which is the first paperback printing of the Hobbit by T Tolkien. So that one can go for fairly good money. You know, sort of. Well, I've seen it. Really mint ones go for a couple of hundred, but a general sort of price is about fifty quid for that one if you come across it. I've had three in my time, so it's definitely out there. And as far as I can see, there was only the one printing, but it was a quite a large printing of The Hobbit. So, uh, you know, make of that what you will. Here's the very earliest specials now. Starting with special number one, Germany puts back the clock. Slipping in those B format puffin storybooks there which is predominantly paddington books paddington bear and a couple of like uh song books puffin song books puffin story 100 and 200 are both in b format delicately putting these in because they're quite delicate books in all honesty and the wartime specials are th these aren't too bad but as the series goes on they get more and more fragile so <laughs> I'm being careful with these as I try to be with all my books but sometimes when you're handling a lot of them you can get a little bit careless if you're not careful so uh, it's worth bearing that in mind I slightly miscalculated here and I've got um, some specials left over which is a shame so I had to rejig that pile and put them back in again thankfully I'll spare you that so now I've got some this is like over, over the shoulder as it were this is me filing away some of my new puffin storybook acquisitions I said so they're all sort of numbered the same as the main series penguins the, the PS prefix on them I said the ones I've been picking up are between generally between 101 and 200 so they all sort of fall in that little area but you generally don't tend to come across them that often not nowadays and if you do it's probably the more common ones
Here we are then. <laughs> so making the most of the space for these Buffin storybooks. It will look quite nice. With this particular lot, I was, I was making my best guess basically about where and how much I could actually fit in here, but it seemed to work out okay in the end. I've always had a soft spot for the puffins, and I remember reading several as a kid, um, and perhaps not realising they were puffins at the time until I saw them later on, and then think, "Oh, that was a that was a puffin storybook." Stuff like I don't know Charlotte's Web and Emile and the Detectives, um, the Wurzel Gummidge books were puffin, um, that sort of thing. The Wombles books I read in the seventies. Um, they're puffing in paperback and the Paddingtons so uh, there's a few there that I'd uh, obviously read when I was younger and The Hobbit as well although I don't remember ever reading the, the puffin one it was the uh, the more common the later Alan Unwin I think it was published one that was the one I read There is the hobby. So I've got a bit of spare space there. But I left it like that because, as I said, I'm still actively hunting down that second hundred. So um, the fact that I've got that bit of space there is really good in actual fact because, you know, the ones that I'll be picking up will be going there. That is from that like little rum. So now this is the penguin collection. So you see that shelf is empty because I've had those out to be filmed. But I've got a lot of like paraphernalia on the shelves there and boxes of books to get out and all those ones in the boxes need to be re a to z'd so basically i'm going to pull off all all the loose stuff all the odd odds and bits and pieces and uh, these are all new acquisitions that have to go back into the collection believe it or not this is a lot there is a lot not so graham green i pulled my ed mcbain's from my ed mcbain collection i'm going to put them back into my penguin collection now that i've filmed them so but there is room there is some room and i've of course made two shells as well so well first off what you're seeing here now is on my other channel on my asmr channel unintentional asmr i've just filmed the sixth or seventh i think it is penguin vintage penguin cleaning video and that's cleaning the books which were uh up to uh sort of the mid 400 so some quite rare ones as you can imagine um, and those belonged on that shelf basically so that's why i'm carefully putting those ones on now and they were in one of those boxes so uh, getting them out carefully out of the way And that was um, a Penguin Modern Classic edition of Brighton Rock, which, um, although it's the right number, um, I put it next to the first edition of Brighton Rock. One of the toughest things with these uh, wartime penguins is 
the numbers are a little bit tricky to read because the spines are so thin, the books are so thin because of the paper rationing. And uh, I'm just there making the absolute most of the space that I've got as usual. But that emptied one entire box. So they, they already had a home, basically. So I've got a, a whole other box of penguins and another sort of shelf's worth to get filed into the main numbered collection. And um, that's going to be quite a job. And that's what we're sort of looking at now. But this was still day one. I was still on day one, but I could only get up to a certain point. And I sort of, I ran out of time and I was just exhausted <laughs> after moving so many books around. As much as it's the most satisfying thing in the world, um, there is a limit to it. <laughs> and I was bushed. Here we are, so this is the uh, the next shelf down. So I'm having to put these to one side so that I can get access to them. So these are going up to uh, about number 600, 630, something like that. And I've not got many to slide away in this numbering section, but I've got some. And this uh, sort of the darker pine, this is a very early IKEA bookcase. I don't think you can even get them like this anymore, but these were much better made back in the day. They're a little bit more expensive, but they were, they're good bookcases. You can see the uh, shells haven't really bowed or anything because they were so sturdy. So basically I've got a slight overlap from the previous lot, and then we're gonna rejig these as we go along and slide in the new ones at the same time. But the new ones start in earnest after uh, number 1000. That's when we really sort of kick in. And if you've managed to stay with me this long, which is amazing if you have, we are over halfway through. You'll be pleased, <laughs> pleased to hear. So I still need to be super careful with these because they're uh, from a period you know, when the books still aren't you know, really robust, like they, they become later on. These are still a little bit fragile. I did recently buy some books off a penguin dealer called uh, andpenguins.co.uk, Andrew. And on his sort of website landing page, he's got his collection of the first 3,000 or so pre ISBNs. And he's managed to get them all on one very large back wall of a room, and it looks fantastic. So there's hope for me yet to get all of mine out at some point 
in like a dedicated library. I would love to to get them all out numerically. You know, going right around the shelves. I think it would just look fantastic. So I'm going to devote an entire wall to uh, to penguin and see how we get on. But the whole process is going to be fantastic when it gets started. I'm filling up all the little nooks and crannies here because I know these pre-1000 books so I only need seven for the set so um, and I get like one or two a year if that Now these these later ones now the books are a bit more robust we're post-war and the printing quality is dramatically improved and the books just get a bit more better made better produced as we go along now just get them nice and uh, nice and neat I pull them out pull these ones out from the main run so the books behind can breathe okay. There we are. Now the bottom two rows had a lot more new acquisitions to file away. As you can see there's loads there just resting on top and they're a little bit awkward to get to as well but you know I do my best same principle that we've just seen except uh, you know they're slightly harder to get to but the books are easier to handle because of their uh, when they were produced so I'm having to check all the numbers as we go along and seeing exactly where they fit in So you have to tell me, is this the most boring video you've ever seen or, <laughs> or is it quite interesting? And you, you know, you're, you're enjoying to see the process of me um, finding homes for all these books. I'd be curious to know because, as I said, I have one of these like shunting sessions, which is what we used to call it back in the in the book selling days. Uh, I'd have one of these about once every six months. So. If you find these interesting, I'll do uh, I'll do another one. I don't think I'm going to ever need to do one quite this uh, complicated or as extensive in the future. But I have still got some more things to do. So I've got the pelicans that are going to need pulling out, and I could potentially film that process um, if you're interested, and a few other. Um, I think I'm going to really need to. Um, I need to give the albatross books a bit more room, so. Um, I think that one's definitely on the agenda. I think I'll have a little rejig of the Badger books because they're taking up a lot of room and I haven't got that many of them and I don't really actively collect them. It's just when I come across them, I keep them. So I think I'm going to pinch a bit of a, a Badger room and give it to the uh, the Albatross books, which I got a fair few this year. Um, I was quite lucky with my really ancient paperbacks, no pans or penguins, unfortunately, but with my really old paperbacks, I did buy um, a few hundred from a pair of uh, old age pensioners who were downsized and they're moving home and they, uh, they had an awful lot of books that were um, published 
as far back as the 1930s and they lived a lot of their lives in Europe so they had they were stuff which was printed like through the modern continental library and they weren't to be sold in the UK or USA and that included the albatross books so I had quite a few of them to expand my albatross collection which is cool I'd love to get some more albatross and you know, particularly the the red crime ones but they tend to go for good good money and uh, more than I can really afford sadly and Agatha Christie one went just recently it was 288 pounds it's like that's crazy money but you know they are rare and uh, often those were the very first times the Agatha Christie's were published in paperback at all which makes them collectible so not too many of the uh, these ones to, to slide into this run but I'm checking them as we go along so I've got a good idea of the numbering and ironically by having the spotlight there filming it it did mean that the numbers were a little bit more easily identifiable because they can be a little bit tricky particularly um, in the loft you know the lighting is not great I've got spotlights up there but it's not like floodlit should we say you know so having the uh, the, the spotlight for filming did make a difference that's for certain Well, we have been quite lucky with the uh, the sounds. It's a bit of a wet day today uh, as I record the audio for this, and I've come out into the shed where it's uh, decent decent sound, and uh, not even hearing many birds. Hardly any cars driving by or anything. So it's uh, just a little. It's like a, a Friday morning as I film this, and it's really quiet, which is uh, seems to be a good time to do uh, to do filming. I probably jinxed it now. We'll have planes going over and all sorts happening, but at the moment it's quite quite quiet. But by now, I am getting very tired. <laughs> I have to say, I'm like, oh, and I don't go that much further on this first day. I think I do this bottom row and maybe the top row of the next bookcase and that's about it but uh, the day after that um, I had quite a bit on because it was my son's GCSE results day and uh, we had to get into the school really early to get those and he did very well by the way And then uh, the uh, the dog needed walk, and I had basically I had quite a bit on the next day, but I wanted to get the filming finished. And I knew I didn't have that much left to do, although even then it still took probably another two to three hours. But I've condensed that down into about half an hour, if that. All looking very nice but I've still got that massive pile on the bottom but when you pull the bottom bits out um, obviously there's space where they came from but there's also you know the odd the odd extra new edition as well but these books on the bottom shelf they go up to about number 900 or so out of the first thousand so what we've seen is pretty much the first thousand penguins or so You'll see a fair few which have got those like illustrated covers on there. They're what they call the uh, the games covers, and they were covers that were produced under the artistic direction of Abraham Games. And uh, it was like a short-lived experiment. They did thirty or so books. I'm trying to get all the games covers. Some of them are reprints, though, so they're a bit harder to come across. Um, but you'll see a fair few of those uh, in a little while. And um, 
I think they're really, really nice, but I haven't quite got them all. I'm about four sure. As soon as I got those four, I'll um, I'll do a dedicated video on them. But yeah, like like always, the worst shelf to do is the bottom one because you're basically on your hands and knees on the hardboard floor. <laughs> I should have got a kneeling a kneeling cushion to do these. <laughs> but I had worked up quite a sweat come the end of the day. As you can imagine. And there really was no easy way to do it except to pull out virtually the entire shelf and then start sliding in the, uh, the new acquisitions. such is the price that you pay for having all the books in order <laughs> but I never in my wildest dreams you know when I started collecting penguins had any inkling that I would managed to get so many of them and that I would amass so many you know down the line but in some cases a lot of collections come and go you know you, you, you get really mad on something you love it and then it sort of wanes a little bit over the time um, something like the penguins they've always been quite a big part of my life and um, I suppose my parents were both fairly big readers my mum more than my dad I think um, and that's where I've got my love of certain authors like John Wyndham and uh, Agatha Christie uh, the, uh, so the classic crime authors my lover James Bond and my dad had all of those and uh, they use those books like those original Pan Agatha Christie's and my dad's James Bond collection they were like the template they were the basis for my collections today they were like the, the foundation books all those years ago I never kept them all but I certainly kept as many as I as I really wanted, you know, as I, when I was younger, I'd move around quite a bit, you know, bedsits and flats and stuff before I managed to buy my own place. And I took what I could with me. struggling a bit here with the uh, my knees are killing me now <laughs> that some of these books now I had some other like extra copies in another spot which was like oh no and I didn't want to go back and have to redo these all again you know so uh, I'm having to check various different piles basically the easiest way to have done this would have been to just completely empty all these bookcases lay them all out on the floor in huge runs slipped in the ones that are new editions and all the, all the ones that were out of position and then stuck them back on the shelf but you know I just to try and film this as well I just didn't quite have the room to do that um, so I had to do it well as you see which is the way we've done it with all the other shelves but I did find this one particularly tricky to do because of its location literally books everywhere I had eight different piles going on <laughs> This is the perils of being a book collector, and this is you should heed this warning. So I say I'm a collector. Other people might say, "Well, you're a hoarder." Well, I'm not because there's, you know, there's method in my madness here. You know, I am 
systematically trying to collect everything that our publishers put out and that's very very difficult to do because there's so much obscure stuff which isn't regarded as collectible in any way but as a completist you want it like you know old crossword books for example that sort of thing um but it is what it is at the end of the day And they do sort of say, once a collector, always a collector. I think there's a lot of truth in that as well. So just getting the last handful of books tapped tucked away here now on this bottom shelf it was quite tough there This last bookcase, or this this big bookcase, started to come together now. It's almost done, and it's a great, great one. It's as I say, it's a really old IKEA one which I've had for ages, but it's a really good one at the same time. And then I was glad to be there, going, "Oh, the last row now," because everything that I pulled out, all those books that you saw, they're all now comfortably in order, and all I had to do was whack them onto that bottom shelf there. And even now, I haven't gone back and put on the the, the penguin mugs and stuff like that. Um, but I will do eventually because that's where they live, you know. But I'll get there in time. Again, that bottom shelf looking good now. But all the while that I'm doing it, I'm also checking the numbering on these to make sure I haven't made any mistakes because it's so easy to do dealing with so many books but it does mean at any point I can just look up a book's number go to the shelf and grab it and I'll have a very very good idea of exactly where to put my hand on and that, that means a lot to me There we are. So we're now on to the uh, slightly thinner, oh, quite old IKEA bookcase here. Um, these are the precursor to the white ones that we saw the pans on earlier. So this is a bookcase I'll probably get shot of um, at some point because it's it's quite rickety. It's, it's just about there, but it's not ideal. And uh, a couple of little George Orwell pamphlets there. Um, but basically it's the same thing these don't hold anything like the same amount as those other big bookcases so the shelves are done a little bit quicker and thankfully i've got other bookcases literally waist height right to the to the right of me here as you look at it so i've got some uh, a little bit of working room as we as we as we'll see but there was still a fair bit of new stuff and at this point this is when the new stuff started to uh, to be added in so i'm having to make the best of what i've got space wise but we manage we manage okay <laughs> so that was the stuff that was the tail end of the last lot and i think i just get this first shelf in this top shelf and then i pretty much call it a day there until uh and take a break for the rest of the day because i'd uh, i'd literally shelved beyond belief <laughs> It was the shunting session to end all shunting sessions, wasn't it? But I can remember doing this back in the days when I, I worked for uh, Dylan's the book bookstore back in the very early nineties. Um, 
they uh, they had massive shunting sessions like this where you'd be moving you'd spend all day moving stuff around to fit fit new sections in and new stock in just incredible but they were bookshops that held you know, 30 40 thousand different books at any one time thankfully I was able to look after this science fiction horror sections and that I always used to be really proud that my sections would take just that little section of science fiction horror and graphic novels which were very very early back then but they did exist um, that section that I managed um, with a couple of display tables would take as much as the main fiction section in the store uh, each week it used to be a real source of pride that uh, the section did so well and I, uh, I had some really loyal customers which is brilliant and then I took them all with me when I opened my own shop a couple of years later <laughs> and they came up to, to Purple Haze but because these are now like chest height rather than happen to be on my hands and knees um, they're so much easier to get these books sorted however as I said I pretty much call it a day um, pretty soon and come back to carry on in a moment there we are they're looking good I'm just about ready to collapse now <laughs> Oh, it looks like I'm going to have one more stab, one more shelf. It's more than I thought I did. I'm literally on autopilot at this point. And if you've made it in, you're a mi an hour and a half in now. <laughs> oh, I was like watching the movie. It's the shelving movie. And there will never be a sequel, right, unless you really, really want a sequel. But um, if we do do another one of these, as I said, I've got the, the Pelicans and a couple other little series that I could rejig the shelves on. But it won't be as long as this. This was a uh, this was long, long overdue. This is probably about a year overdue. This, to be honest, so uh, it was a particularly bad one, or a particularly good one. It just means I've got plenty of new acquisitions for my collections. And uh, I have been quite lucky with uh, penguins lately, so I'm not complaining. When they're chest height, they're so much easier to sort out. <laughs> Plus, I've got like a, almost like a table next to me, the tops of the other bookcases, which I can use um, as like a table to sort out the new acquisitions. So, it does work out quite nice. This is the very sort of last bit. So, I'm having a little rejig here, putting the final bits in. I'll just change the camera a little bit again because I realised I'd left a couple of bits out unfortunately so I'm having to go back and redo this bit now so as I said I had a box of new acquisitions and then I had another pile of new acquisitions and like another pile of new acquisitions or books that had been in the collection and been pulled out to be filmed for videos and because I had books from all different sources it meant that um, I didn't have them all up sort of amalgamated until now so a slight mistake was made and I had to go back and, and refine these and, and put them in the correct position but it's not the end of the world it's just it is what it is but that's all right
I've got my noisy my noisy stool there, which hopefully you're not going to be able to hear very well by the time um, this video goes out. But there was a little bit of room on that second shelf down, which is now full up. So it's given me a little bit of extra breathing room so I can get new acquisitions in and uh, I'm back up to speed as it were. So it's really about just getting all the uh, the new books in place at the moment, which is what I'm doing there now. So I think I had, uh, from this point onwards, I've got you know, new acquisitions for every single shelf. So there's quite a lot to, f to feed back into the main collection. But, you know, that's because predominantly now on the Penguin main series, I'm looking to collect from 1,000 to 2,000 and you know, 2 to 3,000, basically 1,000 up, because that's all I've really got left to, to find now. And there's a lot out there. There's an awful lot to collect, and uh, I have been fairly lucky. The good news is there's not many that are big money. Um, you know, if you're lucky, you can pick up post-1000 main series penguins for as little as a pound a pop. You know, really nice copies. But generally speaking now, they tend to go for a two, 250 if you're lucky. It just depends, uh, you know, most of the dealers I know, if you buy in bulk... Um, they will give you a discount and that's traditional with book, book dealers anyway the expensive way to do it would be buying them it bit book by book off ebay far far too expensive for me to do it that way and i just wouldn't even consider it but um i would uh i would recommend you know getting to know a, a dealer or two and seeing if they're prepared to do job lots because that that's the way to do it really that's the way to get get lots of books for cheap now that I've sorted that batch round, I can uh, pull them up to the next shelf, so I'm making the most of the space. But at least we know that these are now all in order, which is the main thing. And there they are. Just above that, I don't think I really showed it, but just at the top of that bookcase is uh, my uh, my vintage box sets, of which I've got a few. Not many, but a few. There we are. So, I believe this is the next day now. <laughs> and uh, I called it a day there because I was absolutely bushed and uh, I didn't want to really make any mistakes if possible. And they can creep in if you're not careful. Um, but I'm now working on the next... Uh, bookcases below reset the camera and uh, we should be uh, heading towards the end now we're in the home stretch as it were such as it is
But yeah, there are lots and lots of uh, new acquisitions to be filed away. But that's cool. That's brilliant when you fill in a gap, you know. And, you know, when you collect a publisher like this and you're collecting the numbers, it's just the same as if you were collecting a run of old comic books, for example, and uh, you, uh, you'd you found that last issue that you needed. It's a similar sort of thing. But I did think about splitting this video up and you know doing your shelving the pan books and then a separate video with with doing all these uh, penguin books. But I thought now nah, it's going to be it's going to appeal to a certain sort of viewer or not. And um, you know if this isn't really up your street, well, apologies. But um, it is something that you might want to go back to over a period of time. Maybe give you a bit of inspiration to see how I handle so many thousands of books. And as you can see, it, it is literally thousands, isn't it? Managing to hit the camera every now and again, <laughs> just to remind myself it's still there. So yeah, until the dedicated library comes along, this is the best that I've got to play with. Now, it doesn't really leave a lot of extra room, in all honesty, for expansion. Um, so I need to be careful with what I buy. But at the same time, I am, you know, I do love a bargain. So potentially, um, there are certain series that I've got that could come out of this main collection room and just be stored because they're like pretty much done and dusted now. Um, you know, I've completed the set um, and I don't have any missing and I've filmed them so really they could just be put into storage I don't want to do that but that potentially is what might have to happen with some of these series um, just because you can't have it all out on display but as long as I've got my best stuff out like my pan and penguins some of the other series you know that are pretty much done now like say I don't know the young James Bond there's a whole bookcase there but that series is is completely done you know so I'm not looking for anything else on it so I might as well if I get really short of space uh, I'll do that one I'll get that stuff boxed up It's all coming together quite nicely now, which is uh, what we were hoping for. Of course, it doesn't help that some series I have got more than one copy of uh, some books. So certain authors like George Orwell, John Wyndham, Anthony Paul, his Dance to the Music of Time. All of these I've got duplicate copies of. Um, but it is what it is. They're my favourite authors and uh, that's how it's going to be. But that does mean that I'm taking up even more space than uh, than is needed.
There we are. We're definitely making progress, but I'm now onto another shelf, which is right on the bottom. So it's like <laughs> agony time. Double there of a Graham Green, so I recently did a Graham Green video and I've had five doubles and I found two more doubles while I was doing this shelving exercise. So there is a competition if you watch the recent Graham Green video, um, where if you leave a comment and basically share that video out amongst your social media, I'll pull a name out of the hat randomly and they all win seven, not five, but seven vintage Graham Greene paperbacks and I'll send them anywhere in the world so uh, look out for those, that video and uh, you've still got plenty of time to end a couple more weeks yet from when this one goes live and then I'll, I'll do the draw potentially on a live stream possibly We're getting there. The end is definitely in sight now as I'm sliding in all these uh, new acquisitions. Flew out on the floor there. <laughs> and I seem to remember when I was doing this that by the time I got these all packed away, then I realised there was another, yet another pile of books, which um, I needed, which needed to go in with that run as well. So I had to pull them all out again and uh, sort of rejig it. Um, I think I'm pretty sure I've cut that bit now, so uh, you don't need to go through it all twice. But we are literally very, very close to the last bit now. So we've just got to um, finish these last two shelves here. And then we've got basically almost two virtually empty shelves 
just spread the rest of it out uh, you know the run to the end so it's pretty cool So I'm just checking numbers here just to make sure they're all in the right the right spot. I don't know how many people are seriously collecting penguins these days, but it does seem as if there have been some new people entering the hobby because, you know, you see some of the uh, sort of the key books going for very good money on online these days. But the Penguin Collector's Society itself never, they don't really make a point of advertising the society that well. I don't think, I don't think they ever tried to aspire to having thousands and thousands of people in in the club as it were um but it is quite it is quite niche being just the one publisher but it is you could say one of the uh the foremost publishers in the world and they are still they are still going today of course as penguin random house so i'm not sure but i think um penguin collecting particularly the early ones which are almost iconic now and then the penguin modern classics which once again are very highly regarded. I think there are people who collect certain aspects of Penguin within the main field. You know, people there are not many, but there are people who collect just pelicans, for example. Um, they are definitely out there. And I know there's plenty of people who just pick up the crime books, just the crime titles, because you know that's what they're into i've also known people just collect the cerise travel ones because they really like travel writing but i like a little bit of all particularly genre stuff and there there are people who collect the penguin science fiction and that i think it's highly collectible and because there's not masses and masses of it it's certainly something that's completely attainable if you really want to um you know, they, they didn't do that much science fiction over the years. They did a bit more in the uh, the 60s and 70s. But uh, prior to that, there isn't a lot to get apart from, say, the John Wyndhams. Um, so that's an area which um, people do, do collect. And I have done a dedicated video just on Penguin science fiction, which went down very well. And it's obviously got the collectors of it. I said this was the section of the books where I had so many editions, this sort of run, post a thousand to say fifteen hundred, lots and lots of extras gone in here. Which is great, but you know, I need to find the space for them as well. <laughs> so this did take quite a bit of time. Like a big, big jigsaw puzzle.
So now, bottom shelf, and I've basically, I've done what I said I would do beforehand. I've pulled all the bottom shelf off and I've gone through the book switch were new acquisitions and I basically filed them away as best I can so that literally all I need to do is, is like rebuild the shelf that's basically the plan and that's what you're seeing me doing now but you know it's a fiddly little area I'm doing it on my hands and knees it's not ideal um, the bottom of this bookcase is a bit bowed, the back of it, which is why the books go back and they don't sort of sit as nicely as I'd like. But that is sadly a result of the uh, the bookcase more than anything. done this before where I've done these massive massive lines of books along the floor I mean it looks impressive they look like dominoes or something toppling but um, it's great but you're tiptoeing around them um, I don't know how I'm going to do it when I actually get the books to be moved into the library eventually I'll have to do it sort of a, a box load at a time <laughs> so it's going to be quite a quite a, a task that but I have these old comic boxes I've got about six of them and they're absolutely perfect for putting two rows of paperbacks in and they'll fit B format as well on top of each other so you can get the best part of a hundred books in each box so I'd probably like fill five or six boxes of them up bring them down into the the new library and then uh, get them all out emptied and on the shelf looking good and then then go and fill it up again but that's going to be a lot of fun when I eventually get to do that. There we are. So that's that bottom shelf done and no books on the floor in piles in front of it, which is what we were aiming for. Brilliant. So the last little bit now, so the last few shelves. So I'm emptying these are my tail end ones and they can just go right on top of that bookcase because I don't have any on top of these bookcases because behind them is boxes of toys and records and you know, everything else so I need to uh, be able to get to those if I if I you know if I need to double checking the numbers on these as we go along but as I said these sort of tail end ones um, I try if I can to get them in as nice a condition as possible it's not always you know the case you know but if it's something rare I might you know accept a lower grade but generally speaking these are quite nice Nick So there we are. So I can pull out what was left over from the other bookcase, which is what I'm doing now. And then all I need to do is uh, slide in the new acquisitions as we rebuild the bookcase. That's the plan anyway. So all of that were books from that didn't fit on the last bookcase. And then I got my pile of first wedge of new acquisitions that I need to slide in which is exactly what I'm doing now.
us. I'm just starting to pack them away in the usual manner. But this was the last bookcase now. So I'm like, the end is in sight after basically two days of shelving. Shelving and sorting. So I hope you've enjoyed managing to see me get through two hours plus of shelving old paperbacks. I mean, it certainly wasn't epic, wasn't it? And uh, if you if you have literally sat through the entire thing and, and you know you've enjoyed it, well, please leave a comment below. I mean, that's beyond the call of duty. But you know, as I said, you know, I've had people ask me about this before. You know, how do you shelve all your books? How do you store them? This is it. This is it in a nutshell. You know, warts and all, and it's not. Um, you know, it's it's quite a quite a job keeping on top of the collection. As I said, I have perhaps let myself slip by not doing this for about a good month or so. But as you can see, it doesn't take too long to to really keep on top of it. But the longer you leave it, the worse it's going to get. And I do try and do it when I've got at least a, a sizable amount of books to actually make it worthwhile. This was a bit too much. It, it really was a huge, huge run. And um, as I said, come the end, I'm delighted with how it's turned out. I'm really, really pleased. Um, I'm so glad that I've, I've just bit the bullet and taken a bit of time out to do it. And at the same time, make a really long video for you. I mean, if it's something you have enjoyed, please, please leave a comment, leave a little like on the... Uh, on the YouTubes here and leave a, you know, let me know how you file your uh, books away. I mean, are you struggling for space? I mean, almost every collector I know is struggling for space these days. How do you get around it? Do you do similar to me? And you know, do you really fill every single bookcase up as best as possible? I just feel um, I'm not wasting space when I'm doing it this way. some of these it's just easier because the numbering is so small it's easier just to open up the first page and glance at the numbering then but there we are that's that shelf all done for maybe one more on the end.
it's virtually virtually the last shelf now because I've got a little bit of expansion room as well which is what I was hoping for that's what was there beforehand so they're all in order it's just uh, popping in the new the new books now So now I can start putting them into the stacks at the back there. So there we are. So I'm just going to get this last shelf done. And then on the very bottom shelf, I'm going to put my uh, ISBN titles, just a few ISBN titles on the bottom. So thank you very much for watching today. It's been uh, an epic, an epic two hours, 10 minutes, which is uh, absolutely bananas. I think it's probably one of the longest videos I've ever ever produced and as I said it took me a couple of days to film it all and it's taken you know five or six hours even to do the editing and the uh, and the voiceover and you know what have you as well so um hope it's been worth the effort if it's not um you know let me know you know if you're not interested in these videos you know I'm happy to uh, to take that feedback but it's more uh, for for your information this is how I do it as I said I've been asked lots of times about how I share and store my um, books and um, well this is it basically this is it in a nutshell and you will get to see just a very brief tour of the completed penguin shells at the end here uh, once it's all been done because um, it has made quite a difference and I've managed to get it was about two boxes and a big stack of books all filed away into the main collection now and that's made a huge huge difference and i've got over two shelves of more of space that i've still got to play with which does make a huge a huge difference Obviously, if you're not already, do please hit the subscribe button to the channel. I'd love to uh, hit 20,000 before the year is out, and I think that's definitely a possibility. Um, but it would be nice to uh, to think that would be something that could happen.
But yeah, thank you very much for watching today. And as we just play out the last sort of minute and a half, I shall bid you goodbye. And I'll see you again very soon with another video. Bye.